No, it's a custom in uh, occasions such as this to um, thank and, and uh, um, demonstrate one's awareness of, of the eminent people in the room. And I can certainly say, Madam Ambassador, I'm so pleased you're here. And thank you for speaking. And Anne Nicol, I'm so pleased you invited me to come here. And then all of you Vice Presidents and Presidents, um, thank you very much. I wanted first, I want first to, to tell you what we're going to speak about. I'll take about a half hour and then we can speak together for 15 minutes or so. Um, our topic, as I see it, is diplomacy, particularly UN diplomacy, with the um, purpose of establishing or reestablishing peace and justice, peace with justice, is to speak of that in Hammerschold's terms as a profound cultural act, a profound cultural and creative act. That was how he lived it. That was how he, in effect, taught it because he was often in a very understated way teaching the UN community um, how he viewed um, all sorts of matters and how they might in turn also view them. So before we take that up though, I thought that we should summon the image of Dag Hammarskjöld and we can do that through a, a much abridged but nonetheless I hope um, interesting sequence of slides. The this is a portrait of Hammerschel taken in the middle of his years at the UN, which I think we can take as quite classic. This is the marvelously blue-eyed, marvelously composed, um, curiously warm, curiously cold and remote Mr. Hammerschel. And this also is Mr. Hammerschel. This is the kind of scene that he lived for years and years and years. This I think is in, in uh, Africa or I, I didn't take time to check just what the scene is, but this is a scene that was reproduced hundreds of times during his eight and a half years as Secretary General. That his eyes are closed indicates fatigue, indicates that he's been asked too many questions. Um, but this was, his, uh, this was his job, was to face the world, to face its journalists, to face its diplomats, to be firm, to be immensely intelligent in, in front of extremely difficult situations. Now, all of you know that there were two great aspects of Hammerschild. One was the uh, senior diplomat of his time, a diplomat of genius, and the other was the journal keeper, the person who all through his um, young manhood and middle years as a Swedish uh, civil servant, at, one, at the end of his Swedish civil service career, he was a cabinet member, was keeping a private journal, which was never revealed. No one had read it. And he simply informed a friend uh, toward the end of his uh, years at the UN that there existed a journal that, that he would leave a note on it for this friend and the friend could decide whether to publish it or not. This is a page from the journal just at the moment um, in early April when he was on his way to when he was on his way to accept the post of Secretary General and at the top as, as several Swedes here and, and Swedish friends have already read, is are words that mean not I, but God in me. People have taken that as an assertion, as if this is something that could be imposed. It's not at all an assertion, it's a prayer. And this was his fundamental prayer as he entered upon UN service, uh, is that somehow through the flawed human vehicle that he was, that, the, that a righteous providence could act. Now, an, another 
he was quite a poly, he, he, he was multilingual. So what you see there is 16th century French at the bottom and, um, and Swedish in the middle. So perhaps I, there's one thing I would like to translate for you because these were, he was formulating his wishes at this time in 7 April 1953, his inauguration as Secretary General was the 10th of April, as the ambassador said. And what the early French says is from Thomas Akempis, who was one of the sources that he uh, read so very often. He had it with him on his last trip to the Congo. And it says, being founded and firmly placed in God, they cannot in any way be proud and because they render to God all of the good with which they are um, overwhelmed, they, re they do not receive glory, the one, one from another, but they desire only that of God alone. So this is the other side of Doug Hammarskjöld. Um, what one saw at the inauguration was this slender, uh, marvelously composed individual who gave a perfectly wonderful maiden speech at the UN. This is what one saw. Within him, there was, let's just say for now, a prayer. I wanted you to see his handwriting. It's obviously unique. There were jokes about it. Someone, he, he acknowledged to a journalist that it, could, it looks as if it could be read either forwards or backwards and vaguely looks like, uh, like Arabic. But it, it gives you a sense for a, an immensely disciplined, compressed, rather abstract um, mentality, does it not? Uh, so the, the uh, April 10th, 1953, the young secretary general I wanted to show you his places. This is his office. It's a photograph by Paul Niels Nilsson, who was a very well-known Swedish photographer. It's not often published, so it's quite, you know, it's pleasant for us to see it here. It captures the loneliness of the man. And the loneliness had two aspects, as, as I and others have interpreted it. On the one hand, the, the position of Secretary General involves myriad relationships, myriad connections, and also a certain distance of necessity. And that distance, that solitude of someone who cannot be compromised, who, can, who must enter in but cannot be swallowed up, is somehow reflected in this image. The other aspect of his loneliness is that he was, after all, a bachelor. And um, when Christmas came around, he had the experience that so many um, people who live on their own have. He, was, he would feel lonely, and the main, the, the main people who, who knew him, cared for him on a personal basis, would invite him for um, a Christmas dinner or something of that kind. So he did suffer from time to time from a profound loneliness, and, and yet he eventually understood that his aloneness, which is different from loneliness, had to be, that it was, um, that it was a structure, a personal structure, an identity that he could not overcome and need not. Here's another of his places. This is uh, the living room in his apartment on 73rd Street, just off of Park Avenue. There, you know, I'm an art historian, so I have quite a good time trying to interpret objects, but one object, and it's not so easy always with him, but one object that is interpretable here is the ice axe. It was given him by Tenzing Norgay. Do you remember his name? Who was the Sherpa who accompanied Sir Edmund Hillary on the first successful ascent of Mount Everest. And Tenzing Norgay knew that Hammerschold was a very strong mountaineer, although only in the Swedish north country, where mountains, as he said, um, require more 
what he called equilibristics than um, 